Well, good morning and uh, welcome again to Cross Community Church. Isn't it a joy to have Haley back with us? Could y'all give her a hand? She had a baby and she's back leading us and so really grateful for her and her leadership. I'm not a, a very like... I'm not very good at expressing, and so I'm really thankful for the artistic types that lead us well in, in worship. Uh, this morning, we're going to begin a new series, and it's called Uncommon. And I, as I, I prayed about this series and kind of seeking to know where God would be leading us, uh, y'all, we've just been in the midst of a, a series on spiritual warfare. It was kind of heavy, and so I hope that over the next few weeks it won't be nearly as heavy, but we could just encourage you in many of the good things that God has given to us to look at our lives and say, okay, what does it look like to walk in obedience in, in various areas of our lives? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I got to spend some time uh, with a guy named Jay Baker, and uh, he's uh, one of my wife's cousins, got to know him in ministry before, and I love to spend time with Jay because he is the most positive person I have ever met in my life. Sometimes it even gets a little bit annoying, like if you're rooting on a sports team and your team is losing, and he's like so positive that he's like pointing out all the great things that the opposing team is doing, and it's like, no, you can be mad right now, like you don't always have to be so positive, but he's a guy that makes me feel 10 feet tall and uber talented, and he just like calls out the, the giftedness in you and ignores maybe the weaknesses. He's just a, a guy, it's really a joy to spend time with him. As a matter of fact, I admire him in many ways, um, Jay Baker's positivity, uh, his ability to, to be joyful in the midst of difficulty. It's something that I, I look up to, and I, I would desire that would be true of me also. And I tell you that story uh, because what's about to happen in 1 Timothy, we're going to look at today, um, is Paul is going to begin to call out some things for his young protege, Timothy. And he's going to like ask him, like, hey, you need to set an example in these things. The, the word example here is the Greek word tupos, which means this is the pattern. This is the standard that you need to set. This is the thing toward which everyone else should strive. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be in verse 12. This is every youth pastor's favorite verse, by the way, because it mentions youthfulness. We'll get into that in just a second. Uh, but it's not just for our young people. It's also for us. So let's read this together. 1 Timothy 4, 12 says, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. And so again, Paul writing to the young man Timothy, he says to him, Hey, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. And so for many of us, we might think, well, got a little gray in the hair. Um, this isn't so much for me. Now, a, a couple of things that you would need to know. The first is that the Greek word used here for youthfulness was the word used to describe kind of the mature military age. It, it would describe anyone up to 40 years of age. So if you're like me and you're still youthful, right, you're 40 years and, uh, and younger, this would more specifically be addressed towards you. If you're older than this, it might even be the expectation that you're already doing these things. That if you're more mature than this, you're already setting such an example in your life. And so he says to Timothy, even though you're a young man, here's what you need to be striving for. That among the culture that you live in, the people that you minister to, the church that Timothy would have been serving at that time, your life ought to be an example. It ought to stand out. It ought to be the thing that's kind of lifted up for others to in, uh, imitate. It ought to be this level of uncommonness in your speech and in your conduct, in your love and in your faith and your purity. It shouldn't be like everyone else around you. There ought to be something really, really unique about the way that you live your life. So this week what I want to do is to just take a little bit of time and talk to us as a church uh, of Jesus Christ about our speech if you've been alive for more than 20 minutes, you know that we live in a profoundly divided culture. If, if you have so, social media of any kind, you're going to see people that are just uh, like almost like venomous toward one another. It's back and it's you know going back and forth and people are really, really harsh toward one another in their speech. You know that our country's divided with one political party would say that they're the right ones and if you don't believe like they do, then there's no possible way you could be a believer in Jesus and the other party says the other thing. It seems like more and more and more we're becoming divided. And the communication between two sides, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And so as the people of God, we need to hear this commendation from Paul to his young mentee, Timothy. 
you should set an example for all the believers. People ought to look at you and see the way that you speak. It ought to be something that they admire. It ought to be something that they would aspire to in their own lives. What we know is that every single command of the Bible is an invitation into God's abundance. That Jesus, as he would say, hey, come and follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. It was also an invitation to live out the abundant life that's available in him. And so it's true with our speech that as we enter into or we walk and we live in this uncommon speech, we should know that it's going to be for our good and ultimately for the good of the world. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about speech. Generally, when we focus on topics like this, we like to try to give you a survey of all that the Bible has to say about a topic. I'm just not going to do that here, and, and here's why. The word for speech in 1 Timothy 4.12, it is used 218 times in the Bible. Uh, the verb often used for speaking, laleo, it's used 275 times in the Bible. And uh, try as I might, there's no chance I could get to all of those. And so I want to give you a brief survey, if you will, uh, of what the Bible has to say about the way we should speak to each other, things we should avoid, and things that we should pursue. Uh, so let's begin with speech that we should avoid. We've got a list up here for you. Ephesians 4.29, the Apostle Paul says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Like not even one. So this is something that we should be really careful about as we speak. Number two, Colossians 3, 8, 9. We should put aside anger and wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from our lips and not lie to one another. Isn't it interesting that Paul has to write to a church and be like, hey, y'all quit lying, right? Quit slandering one another. But it was true. It was true of them. And if we're really honest, it's true of us that we can fall into these things. So we should avoid those uh, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech. James 3, 10. James tells us that, Blessings and curses shouldn't come from the same mouth. Right? You, you, you bless God and then you curse your fellow man. And so we should avoid uttering curses against uh, other people. Titus 3.9, we should avoid foolish controversies and disputes about the law. You might even just like, just as an aside here, like, you know, this might include political conversations, right? Maybe just, you know, chill on that at Thanksgiving. Like, don't get into it with your family. Don't argue on social media. Uh, but in, in this context, there was disputes about how much of the law of the Old Testament they were supposed to follow. What Should we do this? Should we not? And, and Paul's like, hey, just avoid that sort of topic, foolish controversies. Ephesians 5, 4, we should avoid filthiness and coarse jokes. So you're going to have to put away the dirty jokes, y'all. That's just not acceptable for the people of God. Now, what about speech that we should pursue? Because that's kind of a list of don'ts. Uh, what about the things that we should do? Luke, tw Luke tw 6, 28, uh, Jesus says we should bless those who curse us and pray for those who would otherwise persecute us. You want to talk about uncommon speech that will stand out like, like light in the midst of darkness? When people insult you, turn around and bless them. When people come against you, begin to pray for them. I promise you, you will stand out. This will be unique in the midst of a world that says, oh, no, 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 uh, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back, right? But as the people of God, we should bless even those who persecute us. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another, build one another up just as you also are doing. But this ought to be an aim of our lives, to encourage one another. You know, we've all got some faults. We all make some mistakes. Man, there's brokenness in all of us. And I don't know very many people that are just completely unaware of their own brokenness and fallenness. But sometimes we just encourage one another rather than pointing out faults. Matthew 5.37, our statement and our speech when we make vows or when we speak to other people, our yes should be yes and our no should be no. This is just being truthful in our communication. Colossians 4.6, we should let our speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. It ought to be savory to people when they have a conversation with us. It ought to be something that is enriching and enjoyable ultimately for them. Colossians 3.16, we let the word of Christ richly dwell within us with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thank thankfulness in your hearts to God. We should also pray without ceasing. Now, 
this pretty broad survey, and you might think, okay, that's a kind of a, a big list. Thanks for a 19-point sermon as we got started in the first five minutes. Uh, but what I want to do in the rest of our time together is kind of get down to brass tacks. And the first thing I want to point out for you is that more than you and I recognize, more than we're willing to admit, our speech matters. Like sometimes we think it's just a careless word. Man, man it, something I said in anger, I didn't really mean it. And yet speech is really, really significant in our lives. In, in James chapter 3, James begins to teach really new believers of, about their speech, about how they would talk. He says this in James 3, 6. He says, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And it sets on, uh, on fire the course of our lives, and it's set on fire by hell. Like the tongue can do a profound amount of damage. We sin against others, and we sin against ourselves when we're not careful, and we're not righteous in the way that we speak. He gives three comparisons. He says, you know how a bit in the mouth of a big, powerful horse, like you can just steer that horse anywhere you want to go. That big, powerful animal can be directed by such a tiny little thing as a bit in its mouth. James is like, that's, that's your tongue. You know how a ship has a tiny rudder and yet it steers the whole thing? That's your tongue in your life. You know how a tiny little spark sets the whole world on fire? That is the weight of your speech. That's how important your words can be. Proverbs 18.21, the the writer of Proverbs tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. That we have an opportunity to build people up, to speak life to them, and to encourage them, and we have the ability to tear people down with our words. And so they're weighty. Speech isn't insignificant, it's not unimportant, and it's one of the things that Paul, as he's writing to Timothy and saying, here's how you need to lead, here's the example you need to set, he begins this list with our speech, and it's because our speech matters. How many times have you said something only to moments later wish you had kept your mouth shut? Y'all ever do this deal where you just said something and you're like trying to grasp at your words or or you get mad and you have one of those out-of-body experiences where it's like you're watching a movie of yourself saying things you can't believe you just said. You're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I just did that, but I just said those things and it was me. And somehow you're trying to make up for it or try to recover after you just uttered words that you know were painful and damaging to other people. Our words matter And ultimately, our tongue, in many ways, leads our life. And without knowing it, many of us can lead our life in a direction of pain, in a direction of of, of hurt toward other people, of misery, and we do so with our tongue. Now, here is an issue for us. James 3.8, as James is making this discussion, he tells us that no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, and it's full of deadly poison, and nobody can tame it. And that's a real problem if it's directing our lives, isn't it? It's like the bit in the mouth of the horse, the rudder that steers the ship. It's like a spark that can set our whole world on fire, and yet no one can tame the tongue. How are we supposed to obey what Christ would teach us. How are we supposed to walk in abundance when we've got this tongue that can do so much damage so quickly? I, I want you to know that the writer of Proverbs does say, yeah, there, yes, there is death in the power of the tongue, but there's also life. So in Luke chapter 6, Jesus is speaking uh, primarily about highlighting false prophets and how we're supposed to determine who's a real prophet, who's a false prophet. How do we know the difference? And he begins to, to speak, and he, he kind of lays it out for us, um, something that we can know about the tongue, the thing that should give us profound hope about our speech, that it can be something that would glorify God. Here's what he said in Luke 6, 43. He says, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit. Nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. He's beginning to point out like false prophets. You can fake it for a time and from a distance, but over time your life is going to tell the story uh, of who you really are. 
He goes on in verse 44, he says, Each tree is known by its fruit, for men don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they put, pick grapes from a briar bush. We all know this. But then he says something that's really instructive for us as we think about our speech. Verse 45, he says, The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. The good news is you know, maybe you can't necessarily tame your tongue, but by the power of Jesus Christ, he can transform your heart. And your lips tell the story of what's actually happening inside of your heart. Our words, uh, when we speak about other people, when we enter into gossip or maybe abusive speech or whatever, they say far more about us than they do about the other person. Our words reveal what's really going on inside of our hearts. From the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your lips reveal what is in your heart. James talks about this in James chapter 4. He's like, hey, what is the source? Apparently the early Christians fought a little bit too. There were some issues in the early church. I don't know if it's a business meeting. I don't know what was going down. Maybe they're changing the, the color of the carpet. But there were issues in that early church. And James writes to him and he says, what, what is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Is there not something going on inside of you? He goes on, he says, you lust and you don't have, so you commit murder of other people. You are envious and can't obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. What's going on in our hearts is ultimately manifested in our lives. It's true of our speech and it's true of all of our other actions as well. Fighting in conflict reveals a heart that's focused on selfish desires. When your heart's full of anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness, your speech will tell that story. When your heart is full of greed or jealousy or envy, your words will tell that story. Can I ask you a question today as we sit here for just a minute? What story does your speech tell? When you think about how you communicate with other people, how you interact with them, how you talk about people to their face and how you talk about them when they're not present, what story do your lips ultimately tell? What does it say? What does your speech say about your heart? Say that your heart's full of good treasure, bringing forth good things, good fruit. Or does it say there's some brokenness in there? There's some sin. There's some hurt. There's pain. There's unforgiveness that needs to be addressed and dealt with so that your lips might bring life instead of death. The mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. When I was in college, there was this movie that played over and over and over on the Cowboy Network at OSU. It was like, it was a free channel, and uh, if you happen to miss class, which never happened to me, but uh, there was a movie that was on over and over and over, don't watch it with your kids, it's called Tommy Boy. It's far rougher today than it used to be, or at least I remember it not being so rough, and I, I, as I would watch that show over and over and over, there's a scene that I always thought was hilarious. If, you, if you're not familiar with the movie, it's David Spade who's a small, snarky guy, and then you have Chris Farley, who's kind of a big, goofy guy, and they're setting out to save Chris Farley's father's factory. They're on the road, they're going to sell brake pads, and it's going, it's really, it's a disaster what they're doing. And they, they pull into a gas station one time, the smaller guy, David Spade, says, hey, I'm going to go uh, find directions to our next huge, embarrassing failure. They weren't doing so well uh, selling their brake pads, and he goes in, and he is, he's sarcastic, he's kind of, He's snarky. He's kind of a miserable little guy. And so he's speaking to the gas station attendant behind the counter. He's like, hey, how far is it to Davenport? And the gas station attendant doesn't want anything to do with him. He's reading a book. He's like, 22 miles. So you see David Spade, the young snarky guy, look at a map. And he's looking and he's kind of studying furiously and he can't find it anywhere on the map. And so he's getting a little frustrated because the attendant's not terribly helpful and he needs directions and it's not on the map. He says, hey, I know that you're really, really smart and, you know, fantastic at your job, but uh, the problem is that Davenport's not anywhere on the map. And as he utters those words, the disinterested gas station attendant uh, looks up from his book and he says, 
in a somewhat sarcastic tone that he, you can tell he, he knows what he's about to do. He said, uh, sir, um, you're looking at a map of Illinois. Davenport is in Iowa, 22 miles away across the border, right? So you're looking at the wrong map. And the reason you can't get where you're trying to go is because you're looking at the wrong map. For those of us who would seek to say, God, I want you to transform my heart. God, I want to uh, honor you with my speech. I want to be a person that, that is uncommon in the way that I interact with other people through my language, through my words, through the topics that I speak about. What we ultimately need is not more self-effort. It's not more self-control. It's not that we would try harder. It's not that we would be more disciplined. What we need is a new heart. We need God to restore us and to transform Form us that our treasure of our heart might be transformed in the sense it's the good, we bring out of our heart the good things that are stored up for us. So Jesus ministered uh, while he was here on this earth in the midst of a huge group of Pharisees. There's Pharisees, Sadducees, various camps, but these were very, very religious men. They could quote the first five books of the Old Testament. I mean, they, they knew how to live. They knew how to walk in many ways. They could quote the Bible and all the laws to you. They were revered religious people. And they could never figure out why in the world Jesus loved sinners, that he would hang out with wicked sinners. There were all manner of people that Jesus would hang out with them and why those people wanted to hang out with Jesus. And so they would ask him, like, hey, why do you hang out with tax collectors and prostitutes, these sinful people in our society they could never get it and yet there's an interesting thing that those sinful people they wanted to be with jesus i mean jesus was perfect in all of his ways right i mean he was calling them to holiness he was calling them to transform their lives in the end the religious people couldn't stand it and here's why when you are living a religious life when you're trying really hard to be kind, maybe, in your speech, when you're trying really hard to transform yourself, it's what's known as self-righteousness. And if you feel like you've accomplished some level of righteousness by yourself, you know what you're going to do? You're going to look down on those who don't. If we were to become very self-controlled in our speech, and not say bad words that we shouldn't, maybe not smart off to people, or you know, yell at people, whatever it might look like for us, but our hearts haven't ultimately be, been transformed, it's still going to be manifested in our lives. We're going to be self-righteous up above other people, but Jesus, he didn't come to make us self-righteous, right? He didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners. And so Jesus, he goes to this group of people who were known as the most wicked. They were known as the sinful ones of their society, and he brings the hope of transformation to them. Here's what Christ has done for us. If you're here today, it's true for you. Jesus knew your name. He knew your story. He knew your sin. He knew the circumstances of your life. He knew what you did yesterday and he know, knew what you were going to do tomorrow and the next year and the next year. And Jesus saw all of that and he went to the cross for you. And there on the cross, Jesus bore all of your sin. Every bit of it. Every harsh word. Every terrible attitude. Every curse you've uttered, every bit of it, Jesus died on the cross for that sin, that you wouldn't have to bear the weight of it anymore, and that you could ultimately find new life in him, that you could be made brand new, that your heart could be transformed. And so for the people of God, what we would believe, if you're a believer here, what we would say is that that's good news, right? Like we owed a debt we couldn't pay. We've been set free by the power of the gospel. Jesus went to the cross. He took our sin. He's given to us his abundant life. Like it's good news for us. And what we would claim about Jesus is that he is the way, that he is the truth, and that he is life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Do you know that continues to be true in our lives? No one is going to be made righteous except through Jesus. And so what we need is not more self-control. It's not more hard work. It sure isn't more self-effort. What we need to do if we want to see our hearts transform is to pursue Christ more. We spend time with him in his word and through prayer, and we acknowledge our failures when we do blow it. I don't know about y'all, but every now and then, 
I mean, it's very, very rare in my life that I, I blow up with my kids. Actually, it happens far more than I want to acknowledge. And the frustrating times where you get angry and you blow it, and what happens in those moments is we bring that before God. God, I've blown it. Maybe it's my kid or with my spouse or with my coworker. God, I know this is not up to your standard. Would you transform my heart? Would you help me to walk in righteousness? Because I want to be a man of uncommon speech. I want to be a woman of uncommon speech. I want to set an example for what it looks like to walk in the abundance of Christ in my life. And so for us, the gospel of Jesus, it transforms our hearts. It's not our effort. It was his, right? It's not our works. It was his work. It's not something we're going to earn from God. It was freely given. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that transforms our hearts. When we mess up, we've hurt others, we bring that before God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then we have an opportunity to walk in victory by the power of His Spirit. So today, I want to leave you with just two characteristics of uncommon speech. And what I need you to know on the front end is in the same way that you can't tame your tongue, in the same way that you can't transform your own heart, you cannot live these out in your life. They come only through a relationship with Jesus Christ where you're being constantly renewed. All right, so characteristic number one of uncommon speech. Number one, it is completely true. In every way, it is completely true. We live in a culture where some level of deception is expected in every interaction. You just come to believe that. Uh, when someone is going to list an item for sale, we often go and be like, okay, what's really going on with it? Is the car broken down? Like, what's happening with it? I, I'm not going to pay that price until I've really fully investigated because we live in a culture where some level of deception is expected. We approach almost every interaction with the expectation that we aren't getting the whole truth. A culture where marketing claims almost never match the fine print it's a culture where political or where promises of politicians almost never match actual proposals and where even in the subtle interactions with people we call friends we can't be confident that we're always getting the truth in the midst of that uncommon speech looks like being completely truthful all of the time it looks like the people of God who say that Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life it would be walking in that way, in that truth, in that life, which means we don't utter any falsehoods. That means we would rather suffer loss for telling the truth than to, to en enrich ourselves in some way through deception. Can I say that again? Uncommon speech means you would rather suffer loss for telling the truth than to enrich yourself by uttering some form of deception. It's uncommon, it's unique. To be that truthful. Ephesians 4.15, this is kind of the, the core passage that Paul's writing the church at Ephesus. And he's called on the pastors there, the apostles, all that too, to basically equip the saints for the work of ministry. And one of the things that he tells them is a critical part. He says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Did you know that speaking the truth in love is an essential part of our maturity in Christ. If we don't do this, we don't ultimately mature. If we don't have this present in our lives, we won't properly mature in Him. Now, the, the second piece, another part that you can't do on your own. First, we're going to be completely truthful. Number two, uh, we are going to speak that truth in love. That means that in every interaction with people, our motivation isn't to be right. It isn't to prove someone else wrong. It isn't to humiliate or embarrass someone. It isn't to call them out as a fraud. Our motivation is love. You know, Jesus said some hard things to people throughout the Bible, right? I mean, there were difficult times. As a matter of fact, he told us the, the world hates me because of the gospel. It's going to hate you too. The gospel in and of itself was offensive enough, but Jesus wasn't. He loved every person that he interacted with, and he was motivated by love on, on their behalf to, to speak truth to them, to teach them, to offer his life for them. Now, a, a thing about speaking the truth in love, I'm going to be clear about this, because some people, when I said it's completely truthful, they're like, 
Yes. Now I get to unleash it. I'm going to be completely truthful. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to pretend. I've got some family members I need to call. I'm going to let it loose. Listen, um, love understands that all things that are true don't necessarily need to be spoken. Right? Love says, what is best for this person? I'm seeking their best. And so we, through that lens, we decide whether or not we should utter the words that we know to be true. Sometimes we don't need to say anything. That our love ought to put limits on our lips in some circumstances. Right? Love puts limits on our lips. Proverbs 27.5 says, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. And sometimes by not speaking the truth, we conceal our love for people. We have this weird dichotomy in our society where it seems like uh, we, we go one direction or the other. Um, it tends to be with issues that people have little to no control over or, or, or issues that don't really matter. We'll just let people have it, right? So this is the political discussions you see on the Internet, on Facebook, on Twitter, where somebody disagrees with us, and man, we just we go after them. We tell them exactly what they should and should not believe, how they should vote or think or whatever. We will just open it up and let them have it. And yet... Very few of us know people in positions of power that make very many political decisions. We're generally talking to people who count as one vote and don't have much control over anything. But we sure open the bore and let them have it. But then when it comes down to issues that are very personal in nature, issues that people may have control over, issues that may profoundly affect individual lives, all of a sudden we hide behind a cloak of kindness and we don't speak the truth and love to people. And we'll watch people that we call friends walk off the ledge that we know down a path that leads to destruction rather than speaking the truth to them. And so as the people of God, uncommon speech means we speak the truth, completely true, and we do so in love. And that may mean telling someone, a good friend, a co-worker, a family member, hey, I'm afraid the direction you're headed is going to cause you a lot of pain. I'm not sure you're walking in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Better is this idea that we would offer an open rebuke to our brother than to conceal love for them. Can I ask you a question? When was the last time, one, time someone spoke the truth to you? And maybe without realizing it, you'd kind of veered off the path. You were going your own way, and you were humble enough to hear somebody else come and speak the truth of Scripture, right? It's not someone's opinion, but would bring the Word of God to bear on your life. And you were humble enough to say, you know what, you're right, and you would repent of that. Did you know that God has made it such that we need community with other believers? You need people in your life that you are willing to submit yourself to them and allow them to speak truth to you. And did you know that God has placed you in the lives of some people? To be that person who would speak the truth when they're going astray. This is a part of the body being the body. We don't have everything we need in and of ourselves, but we need one another. So we speak the truth. We're completely true. And we speak that truth in love. Matter of fact, beyond just merely kind of getting by, the Apostle Paul says to his young protege, Timothy, I need you to set an example. And don't make the excuse that you're a young man. Don't make the excuse that you're, okay, I'm young and zealous. No, no. You set an example for all the believers. You be that standard that people can look up to in your speech, in your life, in your love, your faith, and your purity. You should be the man who lives an uncommon life, one that is guided and directed by the Holy Spirit of God. In the midst of a world that's dark, you should be light. It should be true of us as well. And so as the people of God seeking after Jesus, seeking to walk in obedience to his command, let me challenge you one more time today to live a life of uncommon speech, completely true and full of love. Would you bow with me? Father, we're, we're grateful for the power of your spirit in our lives that we know that we can't transform our hearts, but that you can. That we have an opportunity to walk in abundance and fullness, to live lives where our speech is uncommon, but it's admirable. It's something to strive toward that we know will lead to life and ultimately not to death. 
Father, we need you to empower us. We're dependent upon you for every breath, for everything that we would do of any value. We know that that comes from you, and so I pray that you would accomplish that in this church, in the hearts and lives of every individual who is in this hearing. God, would you work in our midst. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.